coming to the day of the BBC research and development experience, um, I think it's a great chat on the Wednesday the 4th, 11 o'clock. Okay. So, you'll see on the website there will be still two topics to cover uh, on that day. I'll be, I'll be going through the topics that I can give, the topics that are more important, or part of the topics that are more important. Um, and then we'll have this user experience thing at uh, 11 o'clock on the 4th. Um, also, at the moment, we're just seeing who else is coming in because there's a bit of a crunch up. We have got enough spots for everybody, so there's a discussion between Fort Worth, Barclays, and the Guardian that I'll be coming into the next one. So, hopefully, it'll be Fort Worth. So, we've got some practical time. Um, thanks, Charles. Regarding the exam, as you might have seen on Twitter, um, so I got some feedback last week about the exam and how this is the first time any of you have had a, an electronic exam, which just seems incredible to me. Computer science, this is the first time we've got an electronic exam. But anyway, so it's not going to be an electronic exam. I know we can't speak about that. And also, the idea of it being, um, uh, what's it called, the being there uh, again. The last question being compulsory question, so it's all compulsory. So I had a few people say that they didn't like that idea either, uh, because they've not been used to it before. So, um, so it's just the same as it was last year. It's the same now. Everything's the same. Don't panic. Um, it's all been set, and everything's the same as it was last year, apart from the questions, obviously. Yeah. So the questions are uh, uh, no, no worries there. So you've got you're getting ready for to submit your discussion topics. It's supposed to be due in week six, right? So go to chunk it a bit for the next discussion topic so you know what that is. Yeah? The star, using Facebook, the bike, article. Okay, so we should be okay with that. Uh, what else have you got? Oh yeah, so this should be one of the last weeks for this um, uh, Free coupon for the book. So if you want the actual book format, PDF, e EPUB, or Mobi, and you want to update to when the new version of it comes out, then you need to get that uh, free quick if you want to do it. You get the HTML notes online for free anyway at the moment. So there's HTML notes online, you just don't get told when the book page is so, <coughs> Want print credits to print out your PDFs for the notes? You, um, well, let's put it like this. You've got, you, everybody who's wanted one previously has had the ability to have your print credits increased, that's how this week. Uh, at the break, come and put your name down here. This is the last week I'm doing it, so if you don't put your name down this week, you know there's no print credits for you. Yeah. Positive effects, I thought. 
Fast feedback cycle, yeah? Anything else? Working software at the end of each situation, good. So that means you can demo with people. Anything else? Yeah. You can have a prototype for this project. You get another prototype really quickly. Yeah. And it's flexible, right? So you can change direction. If you decided you're going to have functionality and that functionality is crap, um, then you can change direction. Or if users don't like it, you can change direction. But if you make an interface design decision or an interaction design decision, and users don't like it, you can change that a bit quickly. And it's just a point of this. So it's not even, you don't even have to worry about it being a big, uh, a massive distribution. You can use the change that you place to the okay. So that's why uh, Agile is good. So, if you were given this question, you'd get a in an exam, you'd be able to answer it, wouldn't you? I'm not hinting at all, so I have no idea what, exam, what the exam questions are. I think it's generally right? Well, that's one of the exam questions. Could you, could you, Decide what agile methods you're going to use, and could you justify why you're going to use it for, the, for interface development and in interaction design? In so as long as you could, that's what you're going to do. What's wrong with cowboy coding? Yeah. It's not like focused on massive complex systems. <coughs> yeah, it's not focused on massive complex systems that are going to be maintained in the future, right? It's there to give you an idea of the Try and um, get yourself, uh, just well, get some ideas together. You know, that's one of the main things. Who's read the mythical man month? Nobody's read the, the, the mythical man month. Bits of it, yeah? Mythical man month. Any, anybody else? Who's going to tell me how to make soccer maintenance?
what's um, so what's so interesting at the what is this interesting at this platform level? Yeah. Should we do the Way that we can separate these, that you can separate the concerns. When those toolkits are often specific to the Windows Manager, how can we more efficiently design for multiple window managers? Well, we've got the separation of concerns. If these two questions came up together on an exam or anything like that, you might want to link one to the other. Okay? And that's the case with lots of questions that you might get. If you see that there's a uh, linkage between the two, then that might be something that you also want to do. Okay, so Windows two kids are often specific to Windows Manager. How can we more efficiently design for multiple Windows Managers? What's the example given in the notes? Without that one in the notes. What framework is really owned by the original and by the second year by the other? Qt. Qt, yeah, Qt, Qt. Uh, framework is usable. So, with regard to the different types of that, with the QT framework, you make sure that you design for that particular framework, and then that framework is the thing that does the, the renders it into a, the correct view. Okay. Where the particular platform, be that mobile or the desktop or the other. Um, there's other kind of uh, there's other kinds of uh, frameworks that also exist. Um, Runtime Revolution is another one. So that has a that has a that separates its program object from the way from the interface actually, even though it's designed visually, you normally code it visually, and it can actually generate the uh, UIs for different applications yeah, for different platforms on it. Right. Okay, so last week we were talking about <coughs> how rights for understanding. How do we elicit information from people? Okay, that's that's the thing that we were thinking about last week. How do we get that information? from users, from individuals. So that's the first part of the other user experience professional. That's really the first part of your job. Getting information, well, first part of the design, the design and experiment section. But two ways, get the information from okay, and now that's done. So if we wanted to get information on, and we had, say, six months, what technique can we use? What technique we might we use? Got, so we've got six months worth of, uh, we've got six months to do this in. What's the, what's the richest, if you like, most deep, qualitative technique that we could use? Moving on side of the customer, so that would be, so we could determine this, that could be anthropology, anthropology. No? Participant observation. We observe what's being done. And the thing about participant observation is we sit with people who are participating and we try to become invisible. Okay? What we try to do is we try to do one of the two. Yeah? And therefore we can observe what was going on, we can make sure that we understood not what people told us, but what they actually did. Because people need things out when they tell them what they do, they need out on the computer. Because it seems to them to do nothing. That's something that lots of software projects fail at. They fail because they don't, they think they've got complete knowledge of everything. But because they've collected by asking people, 
Yes, turning the qualitative data into quantitative data by categorising it. We use and we categorise it. Well, we can do we can categorise it in lots of different ways. But one of the good ways we can categorise it is use thing called um, is, use, is use a system whereby we can either have a structure of answers we already think are useful or going to be useful, or terms that are all, that are all those that are going to be useful. So that means that we've already got a structure into which we slot these terms, okay? Because we're looking for specific things within the actual conversation. We're looking for specific, um, I suppose, precursors to, to knowledge, okay? So that's what we make the category, that, that's what we can um, make the category, that's how we can categorize stuff. Okay? We can also go ahead, and if we don't know, if we don't, don't have this knowledge framework already, we can go through and just as long as we keep going through, as long as we keep iterating all the conversations, we can keep going through and before that, we can go start with the first one, we just underline or categorise the sentences or the concepts that look interesting to us. We go to the next one, do the same, do the same, do the same. Eventually, we'll get a set of categories that's involved with the set of frequency of the information. Okay? Never we can see that that's a useful thing to do, which is important. 
we could slot that into a development life cycle that you already know about. What, what term, what kind of development life cycle could we slot that into? If we were deciding which things we were going to implement, which things we were going to implement based on frequency of mentioning ID and that the frequency problem, what would we do? What's it called? So, Moscow, that's right. So whether we whether we're going to whether we must do this or whether we should do it or whether we won't do it. Okay? Must, could, should, do it. Okay? Must do it. Okay, so how are we going to get this information over to uh, software engineers? Because the next part of your job is you've already collected this data. How do you then make that data into a format that then software engineers, not your ex people, not anthropologists, not social scientists? Psychologists who know all their different particular methods, how do we move that into a format that software engineers might be doing it? Or that will convey something to software engineers that whereby they can they can actually it. Okay. So this this is where you know this kind of stuff is used in lots of different situations, certain scenarios where software engineers don't have the level of understanding or specialism that you guys have. They have a level of specialism in building stuff and in the work that they're that they're doing all the time, but they don't have an understanding of people, why they're doing it, who they're doing it for, what they should be thinking about. Okay. So there's a few ways to do this. So here's one. Who's heard of user stories? Okay, so you've all heard of user stories. Where have you heard of user stories from? I mean, what course did you do this in? What unit or, or did you just like do it by? <coughs> you did it at Agile. You did it at Agile. In second year, so you did it. So you did it at Agile, did you second year, second year? I'm going to do something for me. So you are all experts on user stories. So tell me something. So if we're all experts on user stories, tell me something about what is it? What is it? What is it? What is it? How much data should we use to store? How much information? Okay, as much as it would fit on the store index card, yeah? Probably like 2 by 5 or so the index card, yeah? As little as possible. So that would have something that's very minor. Okay, so something that the developer can assume is obviously clear. Something that the developer can is obviously clear, although subjective terms like obvious are a bit you know, difficult to uh, address. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, an end to end slice, something that um, where the functionality can stand on its own, where we don't have to have multiple cards put together, because obviously it can be an issue there, and there can be lots of problems introduced. So it's got to be succinct, but it's also got to be descriptive. It's got to be terse, but it's got to be just terse enough to convey all the information you need to describe or you need to give to a software engineer. So it is quite good, these kind of user stories. So here we've got a user story with regard to um, accepting credit card payment. So um, this is a story card with notes. So a company can pay for a job for a job posting with a credit card. So this is from taken directly from actually um, a story, well, user story, which is related to building a CV job recruitment website. Okay, so it's a web app for the stuff in that page, web app page. Um, and they're saying that any company <coughs> can pay for job um, posting with a credit card. So therefore credit card is functionality that needs to be included as part of some cart or payment mechanism. And then it says here that we can have Visa, MasterCard, American Express as part of the website, but we're going to consider discovery. So this is kind of good, but what does this what does this thing here say? What, what's the problem with this bit? What information does consider con cons 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 discover? Um, what what does that what what does that mean? <coughs> yeah. We might have to support this stuff. We might have to support this stuff. Okay. But what problem does that introduce to a software engineer? Yeah. It doesn't give it might be useful for us as a note to as a remember, for somebody to remember. If I was giving this card to a software engineer, this thing here would be a bit of worry because the software engineer doesn't know whether to develop some, some, some functionality that allows this to be a card to be used 
If I was a software engineer, I'd go, well, we're just considering it, so let's work for me. Let's not bother. Okay. That's the way I think about it. Um, because I can say, well, sweet, I'm waiting. You know, really. Okay, so if I can, you know, get a pack on the back of the back of the and developing something with that, isn't it? And it takes me less time. Jobs are good. Okay. Brilliant. So this consider is vague. So I wouldn't even put this consider on the note. Because I'd say that's something that a decision needs to be made up to make that. Okay, so it doesn't give any information to the software engineer, but it might give some information to, to a business analyst. However, it also adds a level of uh, ridiculous, it adds a level of um, adds a level by which we're not so sh we're not sure what the outcome of this question has been yet. So for instance, if we give it to a software engineer, I might think. Well, I might as a software engineer or as a business, somebody in the business budget. I think, oh, well, I've said that they've got to do Discover because it says Discover on the car. So I'm good. You know, you, we might presume that that means to us, or it's maybe not implemented, but we've got to pull it. Well, I wouldn't do that. You know, software engineers might not. So that's a problem. Okay, here is a car with too much. Okay, so here, a company can pay for job postings with credit cards. And then it goes on for a whole kind of discourse about what this is all about. Do we need really need it? Accept Visa Master's Plus Card American Express and consider the discover. On purchase over $100, ask for card ID number on the back of the card. The system will tell what type of card it is from the first two digits of the card number. The system can store a card number for future use. Collect the expiration month and date of the card. Okay? So this stuff, this stuff isn't really about that. This stuff is actually about how we implement it. It's not about what we want. It's about how it should be implemented. And this can change because different cars, you know, different cars have different ways of doing it. So this, the person who's written this, is working on their incomplete knowledge of a particular car system or all car systems. So in this case, that's just too much, too much info. Okay. Here, we've got a revised version. A couple of paper check postings. No, will we accept the discovery card? Discovery cards? Question mark. So that's the first thing. That says this can't go forward without there being some way, without there being a decision on this thing. We can accept all the rest. Everything else we can accept. But is it what can we do to the cards? And this note for you are don't have a feel for the card type. It can be derived from the first digits of the cards. So that's an interesting thing. Don't bother with the card type. Okay. Now, why do you think some of these cards, why, why do you think when you go on to uh, most payment systems, they have a little logo of the card types? Why do you think that's the case? Yes. Yeah, because those logos are also, also <coughs> and What you find is that some people who are doing, who are some people in the real world, if they don't explicitly see them, their car is taken explicitly outline. They just have a brain card. They just go, oh, what? Oh, my car's not accepted. It can say it's accepted. Not that it can be derived. Not that we accept all cards or blah blah blah. It's that this actual car itself, if it doesn't show my little logo, I must not be able to to use my car. Okay. It just it. It's got to be explicit. So that's why a lot of people, even though this looks right, you can be right in the first digits. <coughs> the majority of everybody who builds this car knows this. The actual things that you can use, you can use have a little logo so that you can actually see. You might not select it, but you can actually see all the different cards because people want positive confirmation that they can actually put their card in for their start. Okay. okay. Use cases. Who's, who's in use cases? Has everybody done use cases in here? If it's part of your software engineering and blah, blah, blah. It's okay, so quickly then tell me something so that I don't know what you're doing. Tell me what do you know about use cases. Somebody who's keeping it here, you know, you're on the system, 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 you're on the system. Anybody know about, what, tell me something about use cases then, because you've all done them. I hope you've I've obviously revised all your software engineering notes copiously for the second year and the third year, just to get into it. <coughs> uh, the top is that you've got a big price depending on the NFC code. 
get to, and there's a number of different types. You'll find with most of these, most of these ways of transmitting data, they're very flexible. So the thing to think of is that um, it's not like, so you are now where there's a fixed way of doing it in your type. It's not like um, uh, old school Norden, where you've got little blobs of little arcs connected to blobs, blah, 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 where you've got decomposition, etc. It's not like that. Okay. What it is like is that if you, you can have a standard use case, here's a pro forma for a use case that a lot of people um, use, quite common, this one. Now, you don't have to fill everything in, but likewise, if there's some stuff that you've missed off, you just extend the use case. Okay. You can just extend it because it's quite an informal way of doing stuff. It's about conveying understanding, not about following rigidly the design, set of design guidelines. Okay, so all these ones we've been seeing this bit on are all more informal. Okay. okay, who's done a scenario? Who knows what a scenario is? We shouldn't show you that yet. Yeah. Who knows what a scenario is? Scenario? Yeah. Kind of examples of background features. Right, so a scenario. Can be seen as something that backs up a user's story, but also a scenario can be something whereby it stands on its own. So scenarios are a way of getting an idea about the kind of people, what their needs, what their wants are, what their requirements are, into the brain of the software engineer. So it's trying to, it's both scenarios and personas are about trying to get across an understanding to technical people about people that they don't necessarily associate with. So that might be people who are, who are older people, who might be people who think who don't think as logically as they do. Uh, it might be people on this big um, spectrum of diversity. Okay. In psychology, there's a domain of study called individual difference. Okay. The individual difference in psychology is all about the fact about classifying people based on individual difference, about understanding that we're all different from each other and we need to understand those individual and the idea of these shows and scenarios and personas is to get across this information. It's very well used on health side, on health side, the health um, uh, and medical development. So there's lots of stuff based on cancer and lung cancer, there's, there's um, multiple cancer stories, etc., which allows you to understand the problems, the, 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 the emotions that people have when they're, you know, when they've got different forms of cancer. Okay? And that means that as a developer, you're able to create, if you're creating resources for, say, cancer care, you're able to tie into that mindset. So this is really about moving mindset to specialists. Okay. So here's one, scenario one. So Mary has a learning disability. She finds looking at images on the web page very distracting. Okay. So the first thing is that most people with who, when we think, oh, learning disability, most people think, ah, well, images is good, but they're not necessarily because they can be distracted. Okay? No one likes the all images rendered in the following order. And then she's then there is this order <coughs> that, uh, that is in the order she wants. Now, this isn't meant so that you decide that you're going to render all images in this order. This is an idea so that you can build in flexibility to your system such that you can allow this if necessary, because other people might look different. Other people might want to think it's different because we're all individuals. Okay. We all have certain needs. The difference with people and the difference that we often have is that sometimes these individual differences are a showstopper. Okay, they will stop all interaction. Other times they're not, they can be accounted for, they can get over. Persona okay. is a way of understanding people. It's a way of understanding your users or your target user groups. And you might have personas from different age ranges, different social dynamics, different social categories, different um, uh, income, incomes, different backgrounds, so that you can understand how many people might interact with your system. Okay. So here's one, E is sub five. All these, by the way, are taken from the um, international standards for web accessibility. Okay, so the, the persona that's not actually the only service that I'm just jump. Okay. Actually, this one is taken from um, a work based on how people find information about lung cancer. This is, this is, this is, so, 
So this one says that uh, she was diagnosed with lung cancer eight months ago. She has had chemotherapy to manage her symptoms and hope for the life. She found treatment very difficult, lots of side effects. Her husband died five years ago with bowel cancer. She lived in urban social housing. So this first part says, paints a kind of a bleak picture, right? So if you're going to be developing software for this person, then you've got to think that they need to do things as quickly as possible. They're probably going to be scared of certain things. <coughs> Terms and words that you're going to use, and certain information you're going to present to that person. So you need to be, you need to, be uh, to keep that in mind. The daughter lives at, lives nearby and sees her and she sees her grandchildren often. She's an ex-smoker, um, so you know you could associate that with one of the reasons why she might have uh, lung cancer. She attends church, blah blah blah. She does not own a computer. She feels too old to learn about technology. Her granddaughter brings her sometimes brings her articles from the internet about new treatments. Finds them confusing. She telephones her cancer nurse and she will name them, but maybe gets information from uh, when she has a regular follow up appointments. So, this bit here says something interesting. It says she's not technical, technology literate, she doesn't have a computer, so if she's going to get an iPad, if you're going to do a health intervention with your iPad or something, then it's got then the she's going to use it, got to be really simple and not scary, and not be scared of it, and be supportive in that way. It also means that a granddaughter is there a way that you can make. That we can connect her granddaughter when she's there or not to her. So that these, these stories that her granddaughter is getting from the internet can be pushed over to this person. Also, is there a way that we can simplify the language? Okay, all that, you should be getting all that from this. So, if you get one of these on your exam, here's a persona, explain what you would do in this situation if you were given the ability to develop a system, then if it was me, all that stuff I've just said you need to take into account, right? What does it say to you? Okay. When you build these personas, when you build these personas, you need to make sure that you build those personas such that um, it gives this quality and level of information to the software engineer. Okay. Right. And we've also got personas on steroids, so you can't see this in detail, but you can get it online, it's from Yahoo. So, this makes it look like it's a real person. Okay, of course it's not. This is just a random individual grabbed up on that. It doesn't this person does not exist. Here we've got a bit that says what it is she's really interested in. So all of the all the demographic details, uh, who she thinks is good, who she thinks isn't good, uh, and a bit of a background and also the different kind of um, knowledge categories that she's aware of. Okay, so this gives far more information than just a random uh, it's, it's a bit more quantitative, right, than qualitative. Okay? <clears throat> now, I've seen developers in various scenarios with a, with a low beat. They have them just as a, as a little in a card deck, if you like, and when they're developing, they're just clicking through. Oh, yeah, yeah, this can come to the yeah. They're clicking through all these people, all these personas, to see whether their software, how they're developing, actually tries to match what's going on in it. Okay? That's what we're interested in. If they get to a point where they have a problem, but they can't develop stuff as they go through, they refer to these. Now, this might not be the case for standard, general app development, you know, you build an app you like and something out onto the Apple Store or Google Play. But you'll find in lots of stuff that you're doing, then you're not going to be doing that. What's the second most used, or the second most, um, oh yeah, the second most use language nowadays? Spanish. Oh? Spanish. No, okay. <laughs> Actually, the second most used is probably English, because the first is Mandarin Chinese. But yeah. Uh, computer language. Yeah. Java, is it? Or Objective-C? Or some app language? What do you think? Python? Java. No? No? Well, okay, so possibly I'm just going to move But just the lines of code, Jack. Is that wrong? It does that split or something there? It's not the code, that's the wrong type of thing. It's Fortran. And it's Fortran that was made probably in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Fortran is still one of the biggest used systems for, for mainframes. Okay? Even Lisp still has lots and lots of uh, lots and lots of instances and installs. And that's because lots of the actual work that's being done 
in large compute systems that you might be working for, banks, aircraft, these kind of things, they don't change their languages very, very much. If it's working, it's working. They don't want to mess with it, you know, because it's, 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 it's their problem. So the reality is that when I talk about software engineers understanding what I'm talking as well about, when you're working in large global corporations trying to trying to build systems for individuals, it's not just about app development to find it out, it's about a large corporate development. This might seem trivial, but actually that this is really important because this is this is money. Okay, understanding your users is big money.
Yeah, so storyboard is kind of a collection of user stories. Often they're a little bit less formal and they have a bit more information in them, but they also have a direction of travel. So here you can see, it's like, it's like a picked up flow chart, right off. You know, it's, it's got information about, um, right here it's, it's talking about check out shipping, Amazon logo instructions, what to do, blah, blah, blah. Then if something else occurs, if, if something's selected, then these arrows point to where the next, where you should go next, okay? The next bit of the story. And there's lots of different ways to move through these, through these cards. So in this case, user stories are supposed to have everything end to end, as we heard over here, in the actual, on the card itself, so that you can get to slice through the entire interaction. These storyboards are meant to decouple that so that you can actually make the put these cards into different um, orders, and such that those cards can actually be can have direction to the next card. Okay. We're getting a bit more formal. Flow charts. Who uses flow charts now? When we want to convey information to designers, who uses to developers? Who uses flow charts? Business analysts. Yeah. yeah. Nobody. Very few people use flow charts now. Some people do, they're sometimes still used in old, old style business processes and can sometimes be quite useful for um, safety critical systems or systems where you have to think about lots and lots of stuff um, ahead of time. They're also useful in some ways because uh, new technology allows you to, um, <coughs> to test these systems. So you can actually test these flow charts to see whether errors in the logic of the flow chart and the interaction flow chart are present. The other way, the other, the other good thing they're useful for is that you can design them visually and generate out code base. So therefore that code base can be in any different platform and it can be any different, it can be any different uh, language, oftentimes. Um, so they do have some, they do have some advantages. They're testable and you can generate code from them. Okay? And you can often generate prototype, uh, multiple prototypes from them too. But in reality, in the real world, the only time I've seen something like this flow chart is when you down the pub one night and you have an idea for something and then you start to write the full, you know, nodes and arcs and all that kind of stuff on the napkin. Yeah. It doesn't, obviously I go to the posh pubs because we have napkins and not the same. Um, but that's, that's really all, all that actually, you know, that's really what they use for around this. Okay, and then you've got, ooh, you are now, so you all know about your mail, you, Got no need to got no need to talk to you about your mail because most of you have done your mail, you get exposed to your mail and you all hate your mail. Yes. All of us do. It's the way to do Okay, so uh, we don't need to speak much about so who's not used your mail? Thank you.